Buenos días a todos. Eh, mi nombre es Javier Garayoa, soy el director general de Spainsit. Y, y bueno, eh, en este acto, eh, aunque no me corresponda, yo creo que eh, María tenía que estar aquí eh, con, la, con la inicial apertura, pero bueno, eh, tomando un poco la referencia del libro y, y haciendo <coughs> mención en la introducción, eh, Quería hacerles un, un, breve, un breve comentario introductorio. ¿no? Eh, la verdad es que eh, agradecer la invitación a Fans People y, y agradecer sobre todo también la aportación de estos 10 eh, casos prácticos que, que son una, una referencia eh, clave eh, de conocimiento y de, y de compartir experiencias en un mercado como el español en el que todavía pues, eh, hay muchísimas cosas eh, que hacer y donde, y donde todo lo que es eh, conocimiento y, y buenas prácticas eh, va a ayudar a que, a que de alguna forma eh, cojamos eh, el ritmo que, que países más, más avanzados en materia de sostenibilidad eh, ya eh, están y, y bueno, eh, nos sirve ¿no? como referencias. Por lo tanto, eh, son tres minutos nada más. Eh, este agradecimiento general a, a quienes comparten esas experiencias y que, y que tienen una valía especial para el mercado español. Y, y bueno, eh, solo mencionar eh, de alguna forma tres claves. Ayer fue un día eh, en el que la sostenibilidad casi desde las nueve de la mañana hasta las tantas de la noche, eh, con distintos actos eh, oficiales, eh, otros menos, pero bueno… Eh, temas muy relevantes en materia de, de inversión sostenible. ¿no? Esta es eh, una continuidad de, de lo que pudo ser la, la jornada intensa de ayer, pero ya centrada en las gestoras de activos. Y, y bueno, la ministra decía ayer lo del tsunami, ¿no? que, que esto era un poco… Eh, en España eh, esto no, no hay un margen de a ver cómo empujamos, ¿no? como, como se decía hace, hace cuatro o cinco años. ¿no? Ahora ya no es una cuestión, ahora es un poco una cuestión de que, de que nadie se quede atrás. ¿eh? Eh, pero el no quedarse atrás pues, supone eh, rápidamente eh, bueno, eh, asumir las mejores prácticas, eh, eh, poner en el mercado productos, eh, dar respuesta a una demanda institucional que cada vez va a ser mayor, eh, dar una visión, los mercados no, no son reducidos, son mercados globales, con lo cual pues, bueno, es, es entrar en una, en una dinámica eh, muy rápida y, y bueno, con, con poca eh, capacidad de, de quedarse atrás. ¿no? Bien, eh, solo mencionar tres cosas y le, le, se lo comentaba a Elena, ¿no? que bueno, son claves ¿no? y, y, y esta es mi opinión personal, coincido con ella. Eh, hay una aportación fundamental de las, de las gestoras internacionales. Eh, de hecho, Elena marcaba tres patas claves para el mercado español. Yo creo que son muy relevantes, que es la visibilidad de las gestoras internacionales, visibilidad de las gestoras internacionales y el aporte de su experiencia y empuje en el, en el mercado español. Esto es importantísimo. Por otro lado, la, toda la parte de mediciones, toda la parte de los labeles, que probablemente va a venir dentro de lo que es el marco regulatorio del Action Plan de la Comisión Europea, con lo cual, bueno, de alguna forma sí que existe todo un proceso luego de ajuste y de, y de, de implantación en el mercado español, pero aquí estamos con un recorrido en el tiempo eh, muy corto, probablemente en el, en el primer semestre del 2020, según el, el plan eh, Estaremos ya eh, transponiendo la, las normativas europeas en ese sentido, con lo cual eso va a facilitar enormemente. Y luego la tercera pata, que esa es eh, la que requiere un, un, un esfuerzo enorme, que es la de la formación. Entonces, eh, la formación es, es clave. Yo, escuchando a Elena, ayer dije, vamos, es que esto me lo anoto. ¿eh? Las tres patas son importantísimas. Y en ese sentido, la formación, la aportación a la formación por parte de las gestoras internacionales es, otra, es otro elemento eh, clave eh, que, eh, que, de alguna forma, eh, bueno, va a ser eh, sustancial a la hora de que eh, todo el mundo eh, pueda eh, normalizar el la atención a esa demanda que, que vemos, además, que es cada vez más, eh, más relevante. Bueno, eh, 
Solo con estas tres menciones, eh, y ya para, para concluir, subrayar que desde Spainship celebramos estas iniciativas, que en Spainship, eh, dentro de los 70 asociados, 28 son gestoras de activos, que de las gestoras de activos eh, que hay en la asociación, eh, más de la mitad, bastante más de la mitad, son gestoras internacionales, que de los 10 casos que hay aquí, eh, estamos hablando de la mayoría de eh, quienes los van a presentar, son asociados de Spainship y eh, quienes no, la relación es muy estrecha y que de alguna forma celebramos y agradecemos este, eh, este apoyo y este compartir experiencias. Nada, muchas gracias y cedo la, la palabra a los protagonistas, que son quienes comparten las experiencias, eh, y a María por eh, este magnífico libro. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Javier, eh, y muchísimas gracias a todos por estar hoy aquí. Eh, antes de que, de que comencemos, quería dar todavía más gracias. Eh, en primer lugar, eh, por supuesto, a todos los que eh, forman parte de este libro. Hemos tenido contribuciones de Spainship, también tenemos una contribución de Morningstar. Desde el mundo de la academia hemos tenido una contribución de la profesora Elena Skrik, que es una especialista de la Universidad Jaime I de Castellón. Y, por supuesto, eh, dar las gracias a las, a las diez gestoras que nos han querido contar eh, su proceso de inversión y cómo ponen ellos eh, en práctica la, la ISR. Yo creo que eh, editando este libro, la verdad, que, que mi reflexión era que es un libro muy esperanzador, porque si diez gestoras tan importantes eh, se lo toman tan en serio, pues es que esto ya no es solamente ni un nicho, eh, ni una moda, sino que es algo eh, muy, muy serio e imparable. ¿no? Y, por supuesto, también eh, quería dar las gracias al, al equipo de French People, de forma muy especial a los maquetadores, porque si no, pues el libro no estaría aquí y además no sería tan bonito, todo hay que decirlo. Y, por supuesto, también al equipo de marketing, que es responsable de, de, de haber montado todo esto, y al equipo de análisis. Y eh, voy a explicar brevemente cómo va a ser el acto. Eh, son dos mesas redondas. Esta es la primera, va a estar más centrada en, en cambio climático. Les voy a ir haciendo primero una pregunta a cada uno y luego vamos a tener unas preguntas eh, en común. Y la segunda mesa redonda será moderada por Fernando Luque de Morningstar, en España, el editor jefe. Y yo creo que la persona que más sabe de fondos de inversión, por lo menos en España, por lo menos, pero probablemente también... De, de, de otras áreas más amplias y, y abordará temas que quizás nos dejemos en, en la primera mesa redonda. Pero yo creo que, que, que va a ser una, una gran oportunidad para que todos eh, aprendamos eh, mucho más. Voy a ir presentando uno a uno eh, mientras les hago las preguntas. Y mi primera pregunta es para ti, Elena. Eh, Elena, como podéis ver, eh, tiene muchísimos títulos, parece casi un personaje de Juego de Tronos. Y es la responsable de, de sostenibilidad de BNP Paribas Asset Management, también es la responsable del análisis. Y además, eh, además de todo eso, es miembro del grupo de expertos nombrado por la Comisión Europea eh, en el marco del Plan de Finanzas Sostenibles para que eh, haga una eh, taxonomía eh, de actividades sostenibles o no sostenibles. Y la primera pregunta, Elena, te la hago en tu calidad de miembro del grupo de expertos. Eh, ¿Nos puedes contar un poco cómo va el trabajo del grupo de expertos y qué, qué es lo que hacéis? Estupendo, muchas gracias María. Eh, una pregunta, ¿lo quieres en castellano o en inglés? ¿Está en castellano? Porque luego ya todo va a ser en inglés. <risa> ah, perfecto. Bueno, eh, la, verdad, la verdad es que eh, voy a pasar un segundito a inglés simplemente para contar una pequeña anécdota, que es justamente el otro día después de dos largas jornadas en la Comisión Europea. Como funciona el grupo es que 
asistimos eh, una vez cada tres, cuatro semanas a Bruselas y tenemos dos días intensivos de trabajo. ¿no? Y entonces estábamos justamente cenando ya a altas horas y un, uno de los miembros del TEC de origen eh, ga, eh, galés nos comentó que TEC en galés significa sereno, ¿no? Sereno, serenidad. Y entonces nos pusimos todos a reír porque pensamos, bueno, realmente si algo necesitamos es mucha paciencia y serenidad, ¿no? Algo que no estaba, digamos, en la solicitud para eh, cuando postulamos por el puesto. ¿Por qué digo eso? Porque una de las, creo que, eh, especialidad, características de este grupo es que estamos trabajando a la vez que hay todo un proceso político, ¿no? que se está gestando. Y este proceso político no es anodino, es decir, que sí que tiene un impacto muchas veces en el trabajo. El ejemplo claro es en los benchmarks. No sé cuántos habéis leído eh, el, el acuerdo, ¿no? el primer acuerdo que se ha llegado, el Parlamento, el Consejo y eh, la Comisión. Es decir, todavía no tenemos los detalles, ¿no? la letra chiquita del acuerdo, pero sí tenemos las líneas generales. Y entonces, eh, en un primer momento, lo que iba a ser un low carbon benchmark y a la vez el positive carbon impact benchmark, se han cambiado, se han convertido en el transition benchmark y el Paris Align benchmark. Con lo cual, las condiciones, las características de ambos han, han cambiado totalmente. A la vez, eh, no sé cuántos... Eh, habéis notado que los requisitos de divulgación de información sobre ASG se van a aplicar a todos los benchmarks. Es decir, cualquier benchmark, independientemente de si es o no es ASG, va a tener que reportar sus características ASG. Con lo cual, todavía estamos un poco en esa situación de limbo que no sabemos si va a requerir que que diga simplemente, pues no, no tenemos ninguna característica o va a haber algún tipo de obligatoriedad. Así que eh, un punto a seguir muy, muy de cerca. Eh, los otros dos eh, puntos que quería hacer eh, muy rápidamente es recordaros a todos que las líneas directrices sobre el reporte, la divulgación de información eh, sobre eh, clima, es decir, todas las, eh, todas las informaciones eh, financieras relacionadas o asociadas con el clima, eh, ya se ha publicado. Es decir, ese informe lo que intenta es alinear el trabajo de Tax Force o de Financial Stability Board, ¿no? las recomendaciones, con la estructura y, y la forma de reportar que exige la directiva eh, europea de información eh, no financiera. En estos momentos lo único que falta es porque ya la consulta ya ha tenido lugar, ahora está en manos de la comisión y será la comisión la encargada de, de publicar un informe final. ¿no? Eh, el informe o las líneas directrices, para ser exactos, no es obligatorio para aquellos, aquellos tal como mencionabas, Javier, creo que es un punto muy importante para los inversores. ¿no? Para todos nosotros no, lo que realmente nos conviene es que esas líneas directrices sean eh, obligatorias y lo antes posible por la simple razón que ya se ha aprobado justamente el paquete legislativo que obliga a los inversores a proporcionar cierto tipo de información. Y como todos sabemos, la información del de reporte, el nivel de reporte, la calidad de la información que puede proveer un inversor está directamente correlacionada con eh, la información que le provee las empresas. Y a lo mejor luego podemos eh, hablar más en detalle de eso. ¿no? Y para finalizar, decir que el primer borrador del de informe sobre el estándar de obligaciones verdes ya está ahí. Os invito a todos a leerlo, a responder a la consulta tres puntos claves sobre el informe. Uno es la acreditación de eh, las agencias que dan su segunda opinión o lo que se llaman los verifiers. Creo que es un punto muy importante que le va a dar solidez al mercado y cualquier eh, aporte que puedan tener, pues fantástico. ¿no? El segundo punto es sobre el impacto. Hay un primer intento de homogenizar, de darle un marco a los informes de impacto sobre obligaciones verdes, pero es un área muy nueva en la que estamos iniciándonos, es decir, que no hay suficiente, el mercado no está suficientemente maduro. Así que también eh, cualquiera que tenga experiencia en esa área, pues 
su aporte será más que bienvenido. Y para terminar, decir que efectivamente las obligaciones verdes van a estar directamente relacionadas con la taxonomía, así que eh, lo cual muestra cuál es el nivel de interrelación entre los cuatro subgrupos del de grupo de la TEC. Exacto, exacto. Casi no hay nada que hacer. Eh, nuestro segundo invitado es David. Voy a ver si lo digo bien. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say it okay as the first time when we rehearse. David Chuprina from Candrium. Eh, he's a senior client portfolio eh, specializing in SRI. And David, in, in the book, you tell us uh, the story that Candrium tells us is uh, that you're making a big effort to decarbonize uh, portfolios for different uh, clients. Um, but once that you are making this effort, it's also very important what Elena was mentioning about the reporting. I mean, how do you communicate uh, to your investors uh, these efforts so they can see the real impact that their investments are actually having? Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm really sorry I don't speak Spanish, and therefore maybe I will repeat something that Elena has already said. <laughs> so if I do so, just raise your hand, walk away, go grab a coffee, but just let me know. I don't want to bore you with what you have already heard. Uh, I'm sure most of you know Candrium already. Candrium is a European asset manager. Uh, based in Paris and Brussels, but with also a, an office here in Madrid. We've had for over 10, we've been here for over 10 years, and we manage roughly around uh, 120 billion euros in assets. And out of that, over a third of these assets are managed with very strict SRI uh, strategies. Now, to come to your, your question, Maria, for us, uh, carbon is the lowest common denominator that we have today when someone wants to talk about ESG. I, I meet a lot of clients on my, uh, as, a, as a client portfolio manager, and very often I, can, I meet clients that don't really know what they want to do about ESG. They have heard that this is something important. There is regulation coming. I heard taxonomy, I heard TCFD, so you know about all these regulations and initiatives that are emerging to encourage companies to be more transparent about ESG. And of course, over everything, there is the Paris Agreement of 2015. So we have a global commitment to reduce CO2 emissions because, as you know, this is a priority. And I was speaking to some people, Madrid, it's never been so hot in March. If that's not a sign, I'm not complaining, but it, <laughs> clearly this is not, not, this is not good and not enough rainfall is not good either. So we are starting to see the impact. Now coming back to the investors. So I meet investors, they know they need to do something. Where do we start? Carbon is a good place, and there are several ways to approach reducing the carbon footprint of a portfolio. One is to say, I'm going to just remove the most carbon intensive activities, such as coal, such as cement, so construction uh, materials. You remove that from your portfolio and almost immediately your carbon footprint is lower. There's nothing else to do. It's very simple. The problem, of course, with that approach is that in that case you will have, uh, we have a bias. And if there is a, com a rally in commodities, well, your portfolio will, uh, will underperform. The other approach is to Try to optimize your portfolio, so not exclude too much, but within each sector find which company is doing the best. And I'm sure we'll have uh, an opportunity later to discuss what are the different ways companies are trying to show they're doing the best they can. And in that way you don't run any, any particular sector bias and you can still reduce the carbon footprint. Now, investors, once you have explained that, and I explained that to you, you might say, well, it's very interesting what you say, why not? But how can I know, as a client, the impact of my investment? And to show that, at Candrium, we have developed impact indicators, where we show very transparently, in our reporting, what's the carbon footprint of your investment. 
Now, be careful because when people talk about carbon footprint, they can mean different things. I give you a very quick example. Imagine two energy companies. One of them is a small company that's doing 80% of its energy production from coal. So it's very intensive in, in, in carbon. The other one is a large company, very, very big international energy company that is producing only 20% of its energy from coal. If you look at the quantity of carbon per million invested in your portfolio, so you have a portfolio with one million, and you look at how much carbon, tons of carbon per million invested, because there is a small, a small company with a big carbon intensity and a big one with a small intensity, in your portfolio, the big one would be much more represented because of the, uh, you know, the way that usually in the portfolios, if, especially if you are, we have a low tracking error, the bigger company will be, have a higher, expo a higher um, uh, allocation. And therefore, you will tend to stay invested in the small company, even if it's producing most of its energy from carbon, and reduce your exposure in the bigger one, even if it's less carbon intensive. So this is why we show both in our reporting. And we also look at, for our investors, very concretely, for retail investors, we do that in some countries, to show really when you invest in this fund, okay, this is how much CO2 is saved compared to the benchmark, but how much does that mean? How many kilometers could you drive with your car? So this is something investor can really understand and relate to. And finally, we also look at the alignment of a portfolio with a two degree scenario. The two degree scenario means we have a target, is to prevent global temperatures from rising more than two degrees. And that means that we can't just keep doing oil production, or oil, uh, energy production from oil or coal. We have to do more renewables. So a portfolio has to be aligned with that. You need to have, by 2030, a certain percentage of renewables, gas, oil, nuclear, hydro, whatever. And so we look at how far the portfolio is aligned with that two degrees scenario. This is, in a nutshell, talking to, about the impact and how we communicate this, uh, how we show it to our clients. Thank you very much. Uh, now we move to Ladislas Smia. Uh, you are the co-head of uh, uh, research in Miroba. Um, and we are also going to talk about uh, emissions because you have developed a, a methodology that takes into account, of course, the negative impact of the CO2 emo, uh, emissions, but uh, in the story that you tell us in the book, you also um, consider that it's very important to, to counter it with the positive impact. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how to measure this positive impact? Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, maybe just a word about Mirova. Uh, I guess most of you might know uh, Mirova, but not all of you, maybe. So Mirova is a subsidiary of Natixis Investment Managers, who is fully dedicated to responsible investment. We manage 10 billion uh, asset, 10 billion euro uh, asset. So yes, we have developed a methodology. In France, actually, it's now compulsory to disclose some CO2 footprint since uh, the COP21, uh, well, 2015, 2016, or something like that. Uh, this kind of obligation is, is probably going to happen uh, in Europe. Uh, and I know you mentioned uh, all the work which is done at commission level. My Spanish is not so great, so I'm not sure I understood everything, but uh, <laughs> I understood that you speak a little bit about European Commission. Um, but indeed, so it's compulsory now in France to, uh, to disclose about carbon footprint. And uh, when you look at carbon footprint, we, fo fo we saw that the bulk of the market was focusing on the risk part of uh, carbon footprinting, how carbon footprint, or, well, you can apply that to ESG in general. Uh, ESG is a new risk, carbon is a new risk for investors. Uh, we agree with that, but we believe that this is just one part of the story and that uh, sustainability, the transition toward a more sustainable economy the um, transition toward a more low carbon economy well, will bring new risks, but will bring also new opportunities. And if you want to have a full view about that, you need to, to look at carbon footprint with both sides. So actually, 
when we developed the methodology, we have developed two concepts which we thought were important. So the first one, which is not the opportunity side, is the, to have a life cycle approach. When you look at the carbon footprinting from a perspective, if you do not look at the whole life cycle of a company, including the whole supply chain, including the use of product, you might miss something. Because, for instance, uh, an oil company, the CO2 for emissions are quite low. When you look at the direct CO2 emission of, of uh, an oil company, it will be only extraction. It will be only a little bit of transportation. But the use of the product will not be taken into account. So you need to have this life cycle approach. So this is the first principle we have implemented. And the second imp principle we have implemented is to look so at avoided emissions. When we created Mirova, the idea for us was to say the bulk of the market historically has focused, again, on the risk side of um, sustainability, avoiding some risk. But what we wanted to do at, uh, when we created Mirova was to say, as an investor, we don't want just to avoid some new risk, but we want also to participate to finance a more innovative, a more sustainable uh, economy. And being able to identify which kind of company will participate to this, uh, this uh, new economy is what we want to uh, achieve at Mirova. So when we speak about carbon emission, that means you need to understand what kind of company will help to mitigate climate change. And uh, when you speak about uh, the taxonomy, the European taxonomy, I think it's the same idea is to say what kind of green activity uh, do we have? What kind of uh, green asset are we, uh, do we need to finance to uh, foster the development of this uh, green economy? And so when you speak about carbon footprint, but you, you need to be able to say, OK, well, so how much of the, how, how, how this asset is helping to avoid CO2 emissions? So actually, for each kind of uh, asset that we invest uh, at, uh, on at Mirova, we look at uh, what are the emissions, full life cycle, supply chain, direct emission, uh, use of product. But we look also at how the company might help to avoid some CO2 emissions. Because if, if you do not look at this part of the, um, the issue, you might just say, OK, to decarbonize my portfolio, I just need to get rid of all energy-related assets. And then I can invest only in media company, t telecom company, um, advisory company. But you will not invest in a more green economy. And for us, the idea is not to stop investing in the energy sector or all uh, which is related to uh, energy consumption but is to invest in the right asset in this kind of area. So to be able, as you mentioned, to invest in renewable energy, in energy efficiency, in enabling technology uh, such as smart grids, such as electric vehicles. And so being able to assess the amount of CO2 avoided thanks to uh, this uh, technology is a way to, um, so that uh, your carbon footprint will be in line with your investment philosophy, which uh, is trying to invest in the, in the right solutions. So actually, what we do is that every time we invest in a company, we look at how the company product and services might help to avoid CO2 emissions compared to a reference scenario. So this can be tricky because the reference scenario will be, is it past emission? Is it future emission? Is it the, refer the current, uh, the average emissions today, but how it will be tomorrow? But still, even if it's complicated, we believe it's very important to provide this message about how companies can help to avoid CO2 emissions. So this is what we have done uh, at Mirova. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicolas Jacob, uh, you are the head of ESG research at Auto BHA. And well, as you can see, we are <laughs> in the middle of a major um, transition to another economy. Uh, how are you measuring in your portfolios uh, this transition to another economy? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, yes, just also a few words regarding Odo BHF. So there are a lot of French people here. Uh, <laughs> we, we have uh, the specificity since uh, three years now to be a, a Franco German company. So, that's uh, an important point. So, be binational company uh, with offices in, in Paris, of course, but also uh, Dusseldorf and Frankfurt as uh, investment centers. And we manage around uh, 55 uh, billion euro uh, at the end of last year in terms of uh, asset under management. Um, so coming back to your question, uh, I mean, I, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Ladislas uh, just said and the fact that it's uh, very uh, important to take into consideration uh, the full scope uh, from risk to opportunities. Uh, and uh, yes, we developed uh, in our internal model, we developed a, a specific uh, indicator what we, which we call uh, ETA, for Energy Transition Analysis. Um, and this is uh, based on two uh, different uh, things. First one, we analyzed uh, uh, sector positioning, uh, considering that 
each sector uh, may have uh, opportunities or risk regarding climate and, and long-term uh, issues regarding climate. Um, so we take the 64 uh, subsectors and we give uh, a score for each uh, subsectors. Considering long-term thematics and regarding environmental issues, we have five different thematics, uh, clean energies, uh, energy efficiency, biodiversity, circular economy, and sustainable mobility. So each sector is ranked uh, among these uh, five uh, long-term uh, thematics. So this uh, sector scoring accounts for 30% of our uh, ETA uh, score. Then the 70% is uh, based on the environmental block of our internal model, uh, so company by company. Uh, and this block, there is three parts. First one is very classical, it's the environmental management system of the company. So uh, with uh, criteria like uh, carbon intensity, water management, waste management, certification. Uh, then the, the second and third part of this block is uh, to give a, a really a dynamic view uh, to our analysis and long-term view. And we uh, analyze risk and opportunities. Uh, I mean, uh, applying uh, the TCFD framework, uh, probably heard about the TCFD at the international level. Um, and we use uh, CDP data to do that. Uh, the CDP is now, uh, I mean, the questionnaire of the CDP is now using this uh, international framework. So there is, there is a lot of information. Uh, so from the opportunity side, we take uh, initiatives and low carbon products. So this is really uh, an analysis at the product level or service level. Uh, then on the risk side, we have four different things. Uh, first of all, the governance of the climate related issue. So where is the leadership in the company? If it is a, a subject which is uh, uh, run at the board level, the executive committee level, so who is in charge of it? Uh, second one is uh, the strategy assessment. If the company uses uh, uh, scenarios, for example, long-term scenarios, uh, carbon price, uh, if uh, they consider this issue uh, in the whole value chain, suppliers uh, to uh, clients, to the usage of products. Uh, third one is uh, the risk management. Uh, what kind of risk uh, we are talking about? Is it more transition risk, physical risk? Uh, is there any potential financial impact uh, regarding the, those risks? Uh, then the last one is uh, targets. Uh, so what kind of targets the company uh, set? Uh, is there any certification also regarding those targets? And this environmental block, so account for 70% of our uh, uh, ETA score. Then for each company, we have a final score, which is out of 100. Uh, then as we work uh, with the best in universe approach, so an absolute approach, each company is rated uh, relative to the full universe. Um, we divide this uh, uh, final score into five ranks. So this is our internal rating scale from one which is the worst to five which is the best. And of course, more this score will be close to five, more the company uh, will be aligned to uh, a two degrees uh, long-term scenario. Uh, so that's how we proceed and to, to, to give a more dynamic view at the company level. Of course, at the portfolio level, we are able to calculate a weighted average score. Uh, and to position the portfolio regarding the long-term scenario. Uh, then, like Ladislas explained, of course, we also have this uh, obligation to report on the carbon footprint, and we prefer carbon intensity, as we are concerned. Uh, so not based on uh, market value, but more on the, the sales of companies, revenue of companies. Uh, but we really want to complete this approach with a dynamic one, uh, and the French law is also asking to, to, to report and to show what we are able to do and what we do uh, to invest more uh, in, in, the, in the energy transition. Thank you very much. And to end this first round, uh, unfortunately, Andy Howard couldn't come. He's the head of sustainable uh, research uh, at Schroders, but uh, we asked him uh, basically because his brother has developed um, also a, a methodology to uh, try to measure um, how the temperature actually is, is rising, um, comparing with the two uh, degrees scenario of the Paris Agreement. And according to the, 
to the their last uh, estimation that it's in the book, uh, if uh, the, the limit is two degrees, we are around 3.9 right now, which is not very encouraging. So we ask him uh, how, uh, which indicator is um, the most alarming, which one is the least alarming, and uh, uh, how do they uh, review this uh, prediction from time to time? I think that we have a video. I'm very sorry not to be with you today. I always love traveling to Madrid, but unfortunately have been unavoidably held back here in London. Climate change is an unavoidable question for investors, companies, and indeed society. It isn't a choice or an optional theme. One way or the other, it's going to affect us all, including those of us who manage money. Scientists and politicians have settled on two degrees as a safe rise in temperatures, and political leaders committed to achieving that in Paris three years ago. That means cutting global greenhouse gas emissions by 80% per person over the next 30 years, and reaching zero emissions within a decade or two after that. Today, the average person in the world creates carbon emissions similar to the average French person. That needs to drop to the average level of a Pakistani person within a generation. Achieving change on that scale means massive changes. The global economy has been built on energy over the last century, 80% of which is from fossil fuels. We will need to see up to $2 trillion a year invested in clean technologies and far higher penalties for emitting carbon dioxide. And if we don't make those changes, if we don't see that transition, we'll face catastrophic climate change where the risks are far bigger in the long run. Our economists have estimated global GDP could be cut in half by the end of the century without tougher climate action. To us, it's vital that we understand how changes like these will affect the investments we manage for our clients. These are complicated questions. There are no shortcuts to detailed analysis of the changes ahead and the implications for individual industries and what they mean for the companies we invest in. We've put a lot of energy into the topic. There are really two questions as we see it. First, how quickly does climate change move from being a future issue to a current risk? When do the effects we've described start to take hold? And second, how will the companies we invest in be affected by climate change in the future? On the first point, we developed the Climate Progress Dashboard to track global progress towards addressing climate change. It looks across a wide range of drivers, political action, clean energy use, carbon prices, electric car sales, and so on, to estimate the current, what the current rate of change tells us about long-run temperature rises. The question's much bigger than any one area in isolation, and the dashboard gives us an overall view of how quickly all of those things are changing and where they tell us, what they tell us about future temperature increases. We publish the dashboard on our website and update the analysis every quarter. Today, it points to a long-run temperature rise of just under four degrees. That tells us there's an awful lot more change and disruption ahead to meet the climate targets leaders agreed in Paris three years ago. It's equally important to understand what meeting those targets would mean for the investments we manage. Again, there are no simple answers, and in all honesty, we think most of the investment industry has not thought about this nearly enough. We ask, what will change, and what do those changes mean for the value of companies? Carbon prices will be much higher. We built a model looking at the impact on companies' cost structures, the prices of different products, and how demand for those products will be affected in the future. There'll be a huge reallocation of capital from dirty to clean activities. We model how companies' valuations will be affected by different growth rates. There'll be a sharp reduction in fossil fuel use when we look at the impact of, on, on oil, gas and coal companies of reduced production in the future. And there'll be unavoidable physical damage, which we model by looking at the impact on companies' assets over the next few decades of rising physical costs from climate change. By putting all of that analysis together, we can form a view on the risks facing every company. We can use that analysis to help our analysts and fund managers identify and measure climate risk and to help find future winners and losers. We measure the risks portfolios face, and we've worked with clients to help them measure the risks facing funds that they own. For us at Schroders, climate change will be a key investment theme of the years and decades ahead. It's unavoidable, not an option. We are preparing here as well as we can to help manage the risks and find the opportunities that that will create for our clients in the future. Well, so now we have all talk. And what we have seen is that you 
each one of you, you have uh, your own methodology. You have your own approach on, on measuring uh, uh, climate change impact in, in the portfolios. Um, what do you think about the metrics? I mean, uh, do you think that they are reliable? Do you think that they are homogeneous? Do you think that it makes sense to that each one of you takes one piece of data from here or one piece of data from there? I mean, how how do you see how do you see this this heterogeneity? Yes, um, in 2015 during COP21 uh, in Paris, we committed ourselves to progressively align our portfolios to the Paris goal. So basically, that means that when you look, we take the um, International Energy Agency Sustainable Development Scenario, and what we are looking is. What we need to look is exactly what the companies we invest in are in respect to that scenario. In other terms, what you need is, on one hand, um, the absolute emissions. You look at absolute emissions, so carbon footprint. And on the other hand, how efficient companies are, so the carbon intensity. Because I believe you actually need both. Because even if a large company is extraordinarily efficient and has a very low carbon intensity, if the overall carbon footprint is still really high, um, that's not solving the problem. Because as I said, at the end of the day, what we need is to become carbon neutral. And in fact, that is the European uh, Commission's goal for 2050. Now, so what we did is on one hand, we started calculating the carbon footprint. Um, and we did it for all our equity funds first, and now we're doing it for our fixed income. Uh, we haven't done it for the totality of them because of some methodological problems, um, but we are getting there in a way. Now, where are the two key problems that we face? The first one is that of over 6,300 companies, around 48% of those did not provide the information. So basically what you use is an estimate, and an estimate is that, an estimate. So. How do you estimate? Well, basically, you look at the average uh, carbon footprint for that sector. You take into account the business model where they operate you know, and the size of the company. But it doesn't tell you absolutely anything about how efficient that company is. The second problem that you do is that even when you, it comes to scope one, um, there was um, the totality, the coverage of the emissions by companies varies tremendously. When, from all, when you look at all Bloomberg data that is available, only 43 companies in the entire world provide 100% uh, emissions for scope one. I'm not even going to get into scope two or into scope three. Um, it is only 25 more for 95%. What happens is the many companies, they will, they will um, measure it for all their operations, but gosh, I, you know, the one subsidiary that I have, I don't know, in Seychelles, you know, that one did not provide the information, or whatever it might be. But that can make, you know, you can imagine what it means in terms of the final number that you show your clients. So what I'm trying to say here is that, of course, we all have to do that exercise. We have learned a lot, and it has helped us um, also, it helped us to put pressure on companies, and we can talk about that later on. But we cannot forget that those numbers, you know, are more than questionable many times. So you need to take it with a pinch of salt. You need to provide the analysis behind them in order to be able to um, interpret them. The other thing that you need, so that's on the absolute emissions. The other thing that you need is to look how efficient companies are. And basically that is looking at carbon intensities. And you look at where a company is today. So let's say you're looking at utilities, you would think about in terms of kilograms of CO2 by, by kilowatt. -er. If you're thinking about airlines, for instance, then you would look at gram CO2 per passenger, you know, kilometer. Uh, passenger. Um, so then, so going back, you look where a company is, where they aim to get, so what are their targets in terms of carbon intensity for the future, right, because you are investing, so you need to know, or you, need, you want to see where that company is heading towards, and then you see 
whether or not they're aligned with the two degrees, and what's the strategy. And then is that conversation that you have with the company about the strategy. Is your strategy, you know, sound enough? You know, are you making the right investments? You know, capex investments needed to get there. Well, the numbers uh, we've been working with the Transition Pathway Initiative from the very beginning. It's a partnership with the London School of Economics, a group of uh, fund managers and pension funds, and we have looked at all the carbon intensive sectors, except for chemicals, we're still working on that. Well, the numbers are appalling. So if we look at airlines, um, almost no, no airlines provides numbers for after 2030. And actually, up to 2020, they're all, except for one, align, yes? But then you need to, this is where, uh, where I'm trying to get, you need to analyze it. And when you see how is that today, and all of them by 2020 are aligned, it's because they are offsetting their carbon footprint. But you don't have information later on, and obviously they won't be able to continue offsetting for the, you know, for the rest of uh, their existence. And the question is, are they actually investing in technologies you know, that we know exist, but they're quite expensive, in order to really do that change? The answer is no. And then if I continue going sector by sector, <laughs> the numbers are quite, you know, striking. So, so this is why um, we believe, and I mentioned it before, that the guidelines um, on the tax force, you know, align the tax force, uh, climate-related recommendations with the non-financial reporting directive ought to be compulsory, yeah? We need to really push companies to provide that information forward-looking, but actually to also to provide uh, the carbon footprint for their entire operations. Thank you very much. Very, very graphic, Elena. <laughs> David? I think Elena has made some very good points. I will just add a few uh, elements uh, to that, maybe a few examples as well to make it a bit more uh, vivid. Uh, there is a, a, a British food retail chain that announced uh, a few years ago by, that by 2018, by the end of 2018, they would uh, stop using palm oil. Palm oil is responsible for uh, a lot of deforestation, deforestation uh, especially in Southeast Asia. So it has an impact on, on CO2 and a significant one. We would stop using it on all their branded, so their own brand products by the end of 2018. Uh, and so as investor, uh, we welcome this. This is going in the right direction. So what happened is that by the end of 2018, they didn't stop using palm oil. What they did is they rebranded the products. They changed the brand so they could say, hey, our own brand products, they don't use palm oil because we don't have any brand products anymore. <laughs> As investor, if you don't look into it, you might think, yes, well done. Yeah, you've done your job, but actually you haven't. Another example, uh, you mentioned the airline industry. Uh, you know what, the, the airline is, industry is, is facing a, a hard time because we don't have any electric planes we don't, and we're not going to have them for uh, the next uh, 30 years at least. So we'll keep burning kerosene, so oil, to fly. So, but they know that at some point, the airline industry is going to get integrated in the European uh, CO2 exchange trading system. So they will have to buy, if they uh, release too much CO2, they will need to buy permits, it's gonna cost them something. If we get a carbon tax, it will be even worse. So what they're doing, they're buying forests. The airlines are buying forests in Africa, and they are saying, hey, we have this forest, it's uh, two million hectares, so this means that this forest is a carbon sink, we call it, so it's, it's capturing CO2, that's what trees do, they do it very well. And so they're saying, okay, we are capturing two million tons of CO2 a year, we are releasing two millions from our airplanes, so we are neutral. They didn't plant the forest. The forest was there before. They haven't done anything. It's just accounting. And, in the, and by doing that, they are also, of course, buying land in countries sometimes very far away. And uh, this land, maybe people lived on it. They were, it doesn't, is it really, uh, is an airline, a European airline meant to own huge forests in Africa is the question. Uh, so measuring CO2 is, is crucial and as Elena said, it's very difficult. Um, today, 
what we notice is that in Europe, uh, it's companies are really trying to get their act together. They have to in France and other countries. They have a mandatory obligation to disclose their uh, CO2 footprint, at least on scope one and two. They're trying to do it on scope three. And scope three, by the way, you probably know that, but it's it crucial. Look at a car. If you take the amount of CO2 that is released to produce the car, so to get the steel and the aluminum from the ground and then transport it to the factory, then uh, transform it to steel and aluminum and then bring it to the car factory, assemble it and so on, it's on average 8% of the CO2 that the car will release over its whole life. Most of it will be released whilst we drive it. And that's scope three. That's why it makes it's really essential. If you look at scope one and two, you're missing, you're missing most of the emissions. So it is crucial. In Europe, we see improvements. In emerging markets, to take the opposite, we are nowhere. Let's, we, let's not uh, uh, kid we, ourselves. Is there a question about that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a question about that. OK, sorry. I'm not I'm running away <laughs> Just here. Just in case you wanted to jump. Uh, OK, wait. so <laughs> in a nutshell, uh, it's, it's challenging. And that's why we, know we, we are employing uh, 10 analysts in our ESG team to do that because uh, you can't just rely on external companies like uh, Truecast or others. You need to, to, to dialogue with companies. And finally, to also something uh, uh, Helena alluded to, investors, we can also make a difference with companies. So we, we do a lot of dialogue where we go and see companies and try to convince them to, as you said, put a target so at least we know where you want to go, and then we can measure you and monitor you whether you're going to achieve it. And one of the success as investors we had last year was with Shell, of course. You know, Shell, one of the biggest global oil and gas conglomerates. In August, the CEO, Geert von Burden, had said, we don't need a CO2 target. It doesn't make sense for Shell to set an objective how much CO2 we will uh, uh, release. Well, five months later in November, he did say that they will not only they would set a CO2 target for Shell, which is like a very big news for, for us investors and probably for you as well, because it means that oil and gas are starting to realize they are really part of the problem and also can be part of the solution. But you also said, and I will finish with that, that I, th I think it's 3,000 top managers at Shell, and I met one of them last week, and he told me it's actually kind of biting. 3,000 managers will have their bonus, so their money, linked to attaining that target. And that's how you get people moving. It's when really you get them in their, uh, in their purse. Well, you, you ended uh, with bad news, but then it, it gets it got better. Thank you. <laughs> it's less. So if I come back to your question, I think actually you, you, we have two issues to deal with. We have data on one side and methodology uh, on the other side. When I speak about data, if you go look, you mentioned the fact that uh, in most company reports you don't have the right data you are looking for, whether you speak about sustainability in general, when you speak about uh, carbon footprint especially, so most of the time you don't have uh, the right scope one, two, or seldom you have the scope three. Uh, when you go to emerging market, it's even worse. Uh, from my point of view, it's clear that as investors, we should not wait company to disclose perfectly to do to, to start acting, and um, because this will not happen even in the near well, even in the mid uh, mid term future, it will take decades before all companies in the world have a relevant uh, life cycle uh, CO two emissions uh, with uh, some estimation about uh, how they contribute positively. The, it will take. Uh, too much time, uh, we, we will have uh, the, the river uh, here before it happens. So I think we need here a change of uh, mind, mindset and that investors need to work mostly with estimates when they speak about, uh, ca well, about sustainability data, when they speak about uh, carbon footprint, and that you need indeed uh, to work with uh, some uh, data providers. So you speak, uh, spoke about true cost, there is other ones. Uh, the carbon flow in France is doing this kind of thing. Uh, you have people uh, from uh, ISS doing this such uh, approach. But you need some people to help. Well, either you can do it internally if you have huge workforce dedicated to that, but otherwise you need to rely on uh, rating agencies which will help you to estimate 
CO2 footprint with a meaningful scope. Because for me, you can have very precise data on scope one and two, but you, you will miss most of the uh, impact. So it's better to have a, a, a kind of uh, estimate, even if it's not so precise, with a meaningful scope, rather than having some pre very precise data on a, um, on a too small scope. So switching from that, and this is co complicated for companies because companies are quite used to communicate only on a very precise uh, data which can be uh, audited by the third party. Uh, here we are speaking about, okay, let's forget about being precise, we just want the rough number, and this is the kind of data we need to use uh, as investors uh, right now. The second aspect, I think, is methodology. So you mentioned that we are four people here, we have four different methodologies. Uh, I think uh, sometimes it's even worse than that. You can be four and have a six or three, seven methodology. <laughs> Um, I, I, actually, I know some, uh, some investors who have different methodology in their house uh, because they have uh, some specific, uh, well, SRI funds with uh, some uh, methodology and some mainstreaming of uh, ESG funds uh, with that, some other methodology. <laughs> but uh, this is really what is happening. And uh, when you speak about sustainability, even if everybody more or less agrees that, uh, okay, we have to save the environment, we have to be more conscious about social issues, uh, when you, the devil is always in the details, and the way to uh, implement that, uh, the weight you're going to put on environmental issues, on social issues, uh, even when you speak about carbon footprint, whether are you going to use sales on one side, are you going to use uh, market value, are you going to use enterprise value, and these approaches might um, change a lot the conclusion about uh, what uh, the, the way you're going to implement your investment strategy. <laughs> so I think that for investors, for institutional investors who want to work with an asset managers, uh, I'm afraid that, again, it will take quite a while before everybody agrees on a great methodology, and I'm afraid that even if the European Commission came out with some, um, some kind of, well, practices that we can share together, even with that, it will lead to very different practices from one investor to another because it will remain quite a high level. So, as an institutional investor, I think that you have no choice, uh, you need to take the time, take the resources to look at what are the differences between the different uh, asset managers to understand what is uh, making sense for you, what is not making sense, because sometimes you might agree with some approaches and not agree with some other approach. I just wanted to say one thing which I think uh, from our perspective is important, is that whatever the methodology is, from our perspective at Mirova, you cannot say that the world is not going toward a sustainable path. You mentioned the 3.9 degree, uh, well, you can apply that uh, to uh, other sustainability issues, and say that the, the kind of sectoral allocation we have right now is working well. And if you look at any report from coming from the, uh, at a global scope, of coming from the International Energy Agency, coming from the uh, IPCC, the uh, International Panel on Climate Change, uh, you need a switch from fossil fuel to green economy. Currently, we are investing something like 80% of the money in uh, fossil fuel related technologies and less than 20% in green uh, technologies. If we want to achieve a two degree world, we will need to almost revert this, uh, this trend. And so investing the bulk of our investment in green economies and investing a uh, much lower uh, amount in fossil fuels. And if you want to, sticking to a benchmark with such an, uh, well, if you want to achieve that and if you want to stick to a benchmark at the same time, it's not possible because in the benchmark, it will mean that you will need to stick to uh, the amount of fossil fuel in the benchmark. And, uh, and so being able to say, I'm in line with a two degree world, means that you need to understand that you will, need, you will have some bias in your, uh, in, your, in your investment approach. Thank you. Nicolas? Yeah, so I'm not going to repeat uh, what has been said because uh, I fully agree with that regarding uh, uh, metrics. Uh, but that's why it's important to have uh, also a dynamic view uh, and to understand very well at the product level or service level, company by company, and at the aim of our uh, own methodology. And uh, yes, I agree, I mean, uh, given the, the, the current uh, path, I mean, we have to, to stop lying. Uh, Long-term target will not be reached with the current uh, benchmark. Uh, and that's why also we adopted an absolute approach uh, because we have to do real uh, sector uh, choice and sector allocation. Uh, so that's very important. And to do that, of course, it's a, a long way to go, uh, but we have to, to convince also uh, different teams, asset managers, mm -hmm. uh, analysts, uh, that this is a key 
uh, and climate is also a key for social issues, for societal issues, uh, for health, for many things. Uh, so uh, our job is also to uh, make companies understand and to put pressure on them then uh, if uh, they don't change the business model, uh, we are not going to reach the target. So that's, uh, that's a key point. Uh, and you mentioned Shell. Uh, I guess it's uh, through the Climate Action 100 Plus initiatives. So we, you are part, we are also part of this initiative. Uh, and we have also a recent example with AP Muller, Maersk, who announced uh, ambitious targets for 2050. And it's also the results of this uh, investor's action. So that's an important part of our job. Thank you very much. I have to say that honesty is, is very, it's, it's quite scary, but refreshing. Um, we are going to move to the next question, but I'm going to ask you for shorter answers, if it's possible. <laughs> I know that you all have a lot of things to say, uh, and that they are very, very interesting, but uh, we have uh, time constraints. So, uh, David, I'm going to jump to you, because you jump on emerging markets, and, well, Obviously, there is a difference between developed and emerging markets. And um, how do you see uh, the companies working there? And, and what are you doing uh, to try to make them work better, let's say? Yes, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, emerging market companies are, in terms of transparency on CO2 and including CO2 in their, uh, in their operational and strategic targets uh, behind, uh, uh, say, European and US ones. And we are, it's harder to get good data from emerging markets. We have to rely more on estimates, like if they produce uh, uh, 200,000 tons of steel, we will estimate how much ton of CO2 is released per ton of steel, and from that we will deduce their uh, scope one or two. Uh, so the CO2 emissions. Uh, but at, at the same time, uh, the picture is not all black. Uh, let's take China because it's uh, by far the biggest. China is today the biggest investor in renewables and by a huge margin. But they're also the biggest investor in coal. They're doing both because they are growing at 6% uh, a year. They are still very industrial. So as investor, we cannot just say, yeah, we're not, we will not invest there because it's, oh, it's dirty, because Beijing is so polluted. We, obviously, they don't care about the environment. So we look at each company individually. We have to mo do more of our, the analysis ourselves uh, and then decide which company is, there are a few pure players. They're doing like pure renewables, so it's easy. But most of the companies in emerging markets to talk about uh, energy, there are mixed players. They might have 20% of coal power and then 30% of renewables, and the renewable is growing. So that's what we look at, the dynamic. And we invest in those companies where the dynamic is towards more renewables, less coal, rather than saying, you know, it's just all negative. And I will stop here because it's a short answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe just a word. So I'm not going to discuss much more about the uh, data that we can get from companies uh, on CO2 footprint. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, when you look at uh, emerging market indexes, well, what we have done at Mirova is also using our life cycle approach and using the avoided emissions, we, we kind of estimate uh, the, a portfolio or an index, whether it is in line with a two degree, three degree, four degree world. And what we see clearly is that when you look at emerging market, market index, they, they have one of the highest uh, temperature of all, which is quite easy to understand, is that the bulk of, is because the bulk of these indexes often rely a lot on commodities, and when you speak about commodities, it often means fossil fuels. So when you see the share of uh, oil and gas company, of coal extraction company in this kind of index, the exposure to uh, carbon footprint is very, very high, and I'm afraid that uh, when you are an investor in this kind of market, you need to be aware that the the risk is much higher than in other economy, which might be more diversified, so with more services, more uh, technologies, uh, uh, relying less on fossil fuels. When you invest in emerging market, the risk is clearly higher from our perspective. Thank you. Yes, maybe just also to complete, uh, even if we are not very exposed to emerging market. Um, but yes, the question is that, uh, I mean, the, um, all the carbon liabilities uh, it's uh, I mean, the majority, uh, we as developed uh, countries, are responsible for that. 
so of course, I think that we can't be uh, as demanding as we are for ourselves with emerging market because of course they need to develop and they need energies. Uh, so I think the, the good approach is maybe more to, to, to concentrate on a, a kind of best effort uh, analysis mm -hmm. and to see, yes, what companies are doing, uh, but in terms of uh, long-term trend and, and, and effort, uh, I think it's maybe more uh, appropriate uh, uh, for emerging markets. Thank you. And Elena? Very quickly, because I know you're conscious of time. Um, the answer for us is yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense when we rate companies in terms of ESG, and now I'm talking more generally, um, we provide both an absolute number and then a relative or a ranking, yeah? When it comes uh, on the ranking, we group together companies from the same geographical uh, zone. So we will have Europeans with Europeans, uh, Americans with Americans, and then uh, Asia Pacific developed with Asia Pacific developed, and emerging markets, we also will have separate groupings. So what means in practice is that on one hand, you have an absolute number that provides you an overall view, irrespectively of the geographical exposure, I mean, domiciliation, and on the other hand, you do have that ranking that it helps you compare, you know, peers with peers. Um, that said, when it comes to climate change, because of the importance, and going back to what I said before, our goal is to align our portfolios. For that, we make no concessions. We don't care if a company is in China or is in Sweden. When it comes to absolute, you know, their carbon footprint and their carbon intensity is the same, and we apply um, our policies across the board. Thank you. And now, even uh, a major effort for the last question. <laughs> It's like, I understand, uh, because I've been reading uh, all your contributions, that you all prefer to engage with companies and to try to convince them. And, and in general, you are, I have the idea that you are passionate but uh, reasonable people. But uh, maybe it comes a time that you have to disinvest because some things are not working or maybe reporting is not working or you don't have enough data. So my question is, have you disinvest? Um, well, Regarding our uh, equity fund, I would say that uh, there is no major difficulty because uh, uh, the asset managers team are really uh, qualitative oriented um, and they, they already make uh, very strong filters in a financial point of view. As an example, uh, some of the teams they will not invest in companies if the uh, return on capital employed is less than 12%. That means that almost all the problematic, environmentally problematic sectors, I would say, uh, is uh, by nature excluded, like all utilities, uh, uh, materials. Uh, so I would say it's uh, uh, not a big problem for this kind of fund. M more uh, challenging uh, on the fixed income. Uh, because the energy sector is a, is a big one. Um, and, and here, yes, we, we really prefer to, to, to engage and, and to dialogue with companies. Uh, we don't have any sector exclusion policy today, even if we have some reflection uh, regarding a specific area. Uh, but uh, yes, it's yes, really uh, prefer to, to dialogue. So on our side at Mirova, uh, all our strategies are fully responsible investors, responsible investment strategies. So because we have this solution uh, approach, uh, we tend to focus more on what we like rather than what we don't like. So to reinvest in solutions, uh, in green technologies, in uh, in, super, in, te in te companies providing some social benefits. Uh, still, your question is relevant. Um, so we do not have. Uh, exclusion uh, like uh, as a principles but as a consequences of our rating some sectors can be excluded and actually we do not invest currently in any uh, oil and gas company in any coal company uh, because we believe that there is no sustainable growth uh, in this kind of uh, company for the moment so maybe when we will see some shift in investment coming from this company this happened in the past for a company for instance a company like Orsted used to be quite involved in fossil fuel and really switch its investment toward more green technologies. But while we do not see that, companies like all the oil and gas majors are not part of our portfolios. Mm -hmm. Elena. Um, 
Yes, we will prefer engagement to divestment, but we have two big exceptions. So the first one is around what we call escalation. So what happens when you're engaging with a company for a long time and the company is not you know, providing you or is not actually willing to move. Um, that's very much the case for information in the sense of uh, if you engage with a company, whether it is through the Climate 100 Action Plus or individually, and the company does not react, then we scale it up to our voting. So um, when a company's engagement has not come out with the uh, our expected result, then um, we will not approve the financial accounts of the company, the board nomination in the case of the US. If it's still the company you know, continues not to provide, sometimes we will consider it to co-file a resolution alongside with other investors. And if that even doesn't happen, then the advisement you know, might be you know, that one last resort. Um, the other exception is for what we, th what we call our sector policy. So we have certain policies that are either product exclusions or um, just some standards for sensitive areas. Sensitive areas might be palm oil, as you mentioned before, but exclusions, now that we're talking about climate change, is for instance coal. So we have a very strict coal policy. We do not invest, um, which is actually going to be fully implemented by the 1st of January 2020. We do not invest in coal mining companies if they have 10% or more of their uh, revenues generated from coal, or if they mean, um, the, um, the production means 1% or more of the, product, of the global production. As we know, there are some mining companies out there whose um, coal production means very little of the revenues, but actually they mean you know, the cross of the global production. Also, when it comes to electric, electric produ uh, producers, as I was saying, then the metric is carbon intensity. So we are aligning the portfolio, as I said. So we started with 491. That is the carbon intensity for 2017 in relation to the two degree scenario. But by 2025, all our electric uh, producers will have to be aligned with um, the two degree scenario, which is 321 grams per kilogram. Thank you very much. The answer is yes, we do divest. Uh, last year, uh, we decided after many years of engagement and uh, uh, push also industry initiative to try to change these companies, we decided to divest from uh, several coal companies as well as tobacco companies. And that led us to sell out of all our portfolios half a billion euros of assets. Sometimes as investor, you have to put your money where your mouth is. So we think coal is not the future, and therefore we decided to pull the plug and tell these companies that we, we are not going to invest them anymore, sell what we had, to focus on uh, companies with um, a bigger exposure to renewables, and where also the share of renewables is growing and not companies investing in, in the technology that's economically has no future, uh, whose assets, so the coal in the ground, has no future. It will have to stay, a lot of it will stay in the ground. We will not, they will not be able to produce it because it would release too much CO2. So as investor, we simply said, okay, stop, no. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's been very, very, very interesting. And we have the second round table. Eh, solamente un recordatorio de que después de la segunda mesa redonda eh, eh, habrá un café en el jardín que veo que está haciendo un día eh, espectacular gracias al cambio climático en parte, supongo. Eh, thank you very much. Thank you.